Welcome to the Covered Bridges of New Hampshire podcast, where we discuss all things related to covered bridges in the Granite State. Here's your host, Kim Chandler. Hello, Covered Bridge people, and welcome to the podcast. Today we're speaking with Alan Rumrell, Executive Director of the Historical Society of Cheshire County. Alan shares the rich history of the lost covered bridges of the Monadnock area and why the remaining covered bridges are so valued by the community. Here we go. Located in the southwest corner of New Hampshire, Cheshire County is currently home to six historic covered bridges. But at the turn of the 20th century, there were at least 40 covered bridges in Cheshire County. What happened to the Monadnock area's covered bridges? Today we're speaking with Alan Rumrell, Executive Director of the Historical Society of Cheshire County in Keene. Alan is a native of southwest New Hampshire, where his family has resided since 1770. He has been executive director of the Historical Society of Cheshire County for 40 years. During that time, he has written nine books and presented more than a thousand public programs on regional art and history. His passion, as well as his profession, is sharing stories of the region's past. Welcome to the podcast, Alan. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. I know that Cheshire County has 22 towns and one city, which is Keene. And uh, it was built around the Ashwilat River, which is a tributary of the Connecticut River, which, of course, borders Vermont and, and New Hampshire and does create the western border of Cheshire County. And, and most of the county's covered bridges, past and present, I believe, spanned um, both of those rivers. So how important were bridges in general to the, the development of communities such as Keene? Well, bridges were really essential in southwest New Hampshire for the development of such communities because they were important to business economically and to travel and transportation as well. Without bridges, people had to ford the rivers. And that didn't work well in this area of New England. If you were down south or out west where the land was more level and many of the rivers were more shallow, that would have worked. But Mm -hmm. here they needed bridges because of the rocks and the deep water and the, the uneven ground to to operate businesses and to travel easily. I've come across a lot of stories of covered bridges being built because somebody was trying to, to ford the river or cross the ice and it, it didn't work out well for them. And it seems like maybe I wonder if that helped communities recognize that they needed to build a bridge after something tragic happened. Yes, I think that is true in some cases, and especially when you're talking about traveling on the ice. They did a lot of that, but in some instances, there were some serious accidents and some deaths that resulted from that. Right. And what about Connecticut River crossings? How how important were these vehicle and railroad crossings to the communities in both states? The crossings on the Connecticut were even more important than on the Ashwheelit and the other small brooks and streams because of the size and scope of the river itself. The very first bridge across the Connecticut River was actually built at Bellows Falls, between Bellows Falls and Walpole in in the 1780s. And obviously, you could not ford the Connecticut Connecticut River at Bellows Falls. And that was followed by... The uh, Tucker Toll Bridge that you're familiar with, a covered bridge 260 some odd feet wide in the 1840s. And that was replacing the first bridge. Railroad bridges were very important as well because obviously trains had to be on very level land. and You had to keep a small grade for the railroads to, to work and for the trains to move. And when the railroad opened to Bellows Falls, a Covered Railroad Bridge was built right beside that Tucker Toll Bridge, and the the crossing is still used today, although the the covered bridge is long gone. And most of those Connecticut River bridges were toll bridges, and and they were pr- typically built by private um, groups who came together to build the bridge and then re- got their money back through tolls. Is that correct? That is correct. Yeah, and until recently, some of those Connecticut River bridges were still collecting tolls. Um, one in Charlestown, for example. But they were private enterprises, and they were built on speculation, hoping that they would make some money. But they soon realized that 
there was a lot of upkeep <laughs> on yeah. these bridges that they were building. And there was a lot of money that had to go into them to keep them in good shape. So eventually most of them were simply turned over to the towns on each side of the river or to the state itself. Mm-hmm. We know that many covered bridges were routinely replaced as our mode of transportation changed. Can you talk a little bit about why communities would replace a covered bridge instead of trying to save it? Yes, there were really two factors that work there, wider streets and better and more modern bridges. Uh, We know that the city replaced the West Street covered bridge over the Ashwila River in Keene in 1900 when the street was widened. And that's essentially why they did it. The covered bridges were one lane bridges, so they tended to slow down traffic as towns and cities got larger and busier. So the covered bridge there had been built in 1837 and it was removed in 1900 because they needed a wider street for more traffic. I know that uh, Langdon is not part of Cheshire County, but they bypassed both of their covered bridges in order to keep them, but that was more in the 1950s or so. Do do you think that a community like Keene really didn't have that option just because of how busy Keene is? Or do you think that it wasn't really um, a focus in the early 1900s to preserve historic structures? Well, both of those are true. But in a town like Keene, a city like Keene, indeed, they could not bypass them. They needed those roads and streets and they needed the wider bridges. So today, um, speeding automobiles can go on four lanes instead of across Mm -hmm. a one lane covered bridge. Um, They did, by the middle of the 1900s, want to preserve these bridges as much as possible. But most of the ones in the larger towns and cities were gone by then. But Langdon, indeed, was was able to bypass them, just as Stoddard bypassed the Stone Arch Bridge there on Route 9, so they could preserve that. Can you talk about railroad covered bridges in Cheshire County? Yeah, there were at least four railroad bridges in Keene. <clears throat> the uh, Cheshire Railroad built a bridge over the Ashwheel River west of Island Street when they installed the railroad. But the railroad bridges were always in constant danger of fire. Mm. The bridge near Island Street was ignited by a spark from a passing locomotive early in the morning uh, in October in 1866, and it was completely destroyed within 20 minutes. So it mm. went up really quickly. But it was replaced by another covered bridge at the same location. There was also a covered railroad bridge on the Ashwheelet Railroad line, and that crossed the Ashwheelet River east of Winchester Street. And if you ever see a copy of the 1877 Bird's Eye View map of Keene, you can see all of these covered bridges. Okay. The final railroad bridge in Keene didn't cross a river at all. It crossed another rail line and one of the streets in the city. The Manchester and Keene Railroad, the line that went out to Harrisville and Hancock, um, wasn't allowed to use the Cheshire Railroad lines, their tracks, to get out of town. So they had to find another way to get out of Keene to the east, and the railroad had to build a bridge, a long covered bridge, to get its trains across the Cheshire Railroad line and across the Eastern Avenue. So it crossed a rail line and it crossed Eastern Avenue all at the same time. So if you've ever noticed the large abutments beside Eastern Avenue in Keene, mm-hmm. that's where the covered bridge was located. Interesting. So they weren't allowed to use lines that were already there. <laughs> no, well, they, they asked for them, but... The Cheshire would not let them use their track to get out of town because they were competitors. Right. Interesting. It's it's amazing to me living in this area and, and hiking and walking. The the infrastructure that went in for the railroad for such a short time period is spectacular. Yes. And to think of all the work that they did to bring the railroads here and now it's just it's gone. Gone, right. Well, I just just did a Monadnock moment on the Stone Arch Bridge in South Keene, the railroad bridge. And it's amazing. You're right. The, the amount of work that they did to build the railroad through here in three years with lots of high Stone Arch bridges and covered bridges and grading the line to keep mm-hmm. the trains moving forward. The town of Winchester, which is south of Keene, uh, their covered bridges lasted until the 1940s. In fact, there's actually still two left, which is wonderful. Uh, yes. The middle bridge in Winchester was taken out in 19 in 1940, and the sawmill box top bridge lasted until 1948. Do we know why Winchester chose to take those two bridges down? 
Well, we know about one of them, and I assume the reason is the same for both, and it was the same reasons that the two Keene Highway bridges were replaced, the one on West Street that we talked about and the one on Winchester Street. Mm -hmm. When the new bridge was built to replace the covered middle bridge in Winchester, the Sentinel reported that the new span, quote, is a steel girder bridge with no superstructure and is wider than the old covered bridge to provide for the increase in traffic on this highway since the completion of the Winchester Northfield Road, which has become part of State Route 10. So indeed, increased traffic, right. wider roads, and the vote to replace the bridge actually is recorded in the town meeting minutes of 1940. And then the same thing happened with the sawmill bridge in 1947 at town meeting. Wow. But they but they kept two. They kept the right. Ashwilat, which is a fabulous bridge, and um, which is sort of a busy area, but I guess not as busy as where Route 10 ended up. Correct. Not as busy as those main roads. Yes. Right. Right. And, and statewide, well, nationally, several covered bridges were lost during different flood events. And there was um, a, a freshet in 1869 that destroyed the bridge at the location where the Carlton Bridge is now and right. the first Connecticut River Bridge in Hinsdale. Can you, can you talk about that flood event? Do you, what, what do you know about the flood of 1869? Well, first of all, a, a freshet generally is considered to be caused by melting snow and ice, often combined with heavy rainfall in the spring, but now people use it to describe any flooding event. And the one in 1869 occurred in October, so it wasn't related to a spring flood. And over three days in the region, the area got seven and a half inches of rain. So water mm. levels in the local brooks and rivers went up rapidly, as we've seen in some recent years. And by October 4th, highway bridges were beginning to disappear into the, into the waters of the roar, roaring streams. And rail lines were washed out in several locations and the trains couldn't, couldn't run. Buildings along the Ashwheelit River and Beaver Brook here in Keene really got a lot of damage, but Brattleboro was especially hard hit with the flooding that occurred there. Several major bridges washed out there, including some across the Connecticut, as you mentioned, and businesses and homes along Whetstone, Whetstone Brook were also destroyed. And actually two people died in, mm. in the flooding there. Locally, the crops, many crops were destroyed and one farmer in Keene lost 36 sheep that drowned mm. in the flood. The Troy Blanket Mills was undermined, and the lower level of the building was a complete loss. And one of the saddest stories from that flood was the story of Charles Bingham, who just finished building his new house on the banks of Millbrook in Gilsom. He had moved his furniture in. His family wasn't there yet, but he was spending the night. And as he was sleeping in his new house on that night, he barely managed to escape through a bedroom window in the house as his possessions washed away in the flood mm -hmm. and the damage was, was extensive to his house and, and throughout the area. But no one in our region died as a result of that flood. That's a terrible story. <laughs> <That's awful. laughs> you asked the question. <laughs> oh, God, that's so sad. I know weather forecasting is certainly different today Correct. than it was then. But I mean, is that something that people could, did the water rise slow enough that people could see it coming? Or do you feel like it was? I think when it got to the, to the high point, they did not realize it. And it sounded like it really peaked in, in the night, in, in the, the dark night. where that man was living. But you're right. They did not have the weather reporting capabilities that we have today. And even in 1938, they had no idea there was a hurricane that was going to hit Cheshire County before it arrived. Tell me about the 1938 hurricane in, in Keene and in Cheshire County. Well, it did millions of dollars of damage. It destroyed quite a few homes. It destroyed bridges and flooded roads. And it took down thousands and thousands of trees throughout the region. So we really were cut off from the outside. The trains couldn't run. The roads were closed and the power was out as well. So it, it did a great deal of damage all across the region. Many of the lakes in the area flooded. And it was several days before we found out what was happening in the outside world. And it obviously, with no 
chainsaws and no heavy equipment. It took them a long time to to remove the trees and to to recover from that that flood. That hurricane destroyed the Faulkner and Colony Bridge in in Keene. Can you talk a little yes. bit about that mill and how relevant that was to Keene? The Faulkner and Colony Mill um, was started in 1815 as a textile firm, and it was one of the largest and most important factories in the history of the region. Uh, the Faulkner and Colony families made woolens, um, flannels that they sold all over the country. They had an outlet shop in New York City, actually. And they did especially well during wartime because the military needed lots of cloth for uniforms and blankets, and they worked around the clock on three shifts during the Civil War, World War I, and World War II. The company was in the same family for about 150 years. It was one of the oldest textile mills operated by the same family. But by the early 1950s, they could not compete with less expensive wool that was being made in the South. And now, of course, most of our cloth comes from overseas. So mm -hmm. Things have changed, and that mill has been has been gone from the landscape since the 1950s, okay. although the building survives. Mm -hmm. And there was a beautiful covered bridge there. <laughs> yes, it was rather an unusual bridge <laughs> because it crossed over the top of the dam. It was above yep. the dam yep. at the Faulkner and Colony Mill Pond, and it didn't really carry any regular traffic. And it didn't allow the Faulkners and colony ownership to access the land that they couldn't get to across the river. They could just simply go to West Street a couple of hundred feet away and cross the highway bridge. So I think maybe originally it may have allowed access to the dam itself, perhaps for repairs or inspections. But when they made it a covered bridge that really the sides were enclosed, which restricted access to the dam below. So it was a very narrow bridge, only a small wagon could cross. And I think by the time it was lost in the flood of 1938, it was simply picturesque and mm -hmm. didn't have any real purpose for, okay. for the company. So it was never rebuilt. But there are wonderful, well, sad photographs of it in two pieces floating in the river. Mm. Yeah, there. Unfortunately, there are a lot of photos of covered bridges in multiple pieces <laughs> that I've seen. They're 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 hard to see for me. Um, and and how did that? That's a beautiful park area today. How did that area become the park that it is now? Well, it began with some of the Faulkner and Colony land. By 1960, it was owned by. Um, Edward Kingsbury, who was involved with the Kingsbury Machine Tool Corporation here in Keene, he offered 46 acres of land along the river there to the city if it would be made into a public city park for the residents and visitors to enjoy. And a committee studied the proposal to see if it was possible to set up a park there. They recommended it. And in 1963, the city agreed to accept the land and establish the park. For quite a few years, there wasn't a great deal of work that was done there. After 63, a bird sanctuary was established, a gazebo constructed, and then they put the boat launch area in. But when an acre of land bordering on West Street itself was donated in 1996, that allowed the removal of a former gas station and some commercial buildings, and much more work was done. So we got the familiar face of the Ashwilet River Park as we know it today, and it's right in the downtown, but it's wonderful natural area to enjoy. So it is, it's good for the local residents. Were there any other covered bridges in the region that were lost to flooding? Another famous flood that you're probably familiar with was the flood of 1936, which did come in the spring, and they had 10 inches of rain and and melting snow, and it truly was a freshet because it arrived early in March and the snow contributed to the flooding, but many bridges and roads were destroyed by the flood, but there was one covered bridge in Westmoreland, the county farm bridge, which um, crossed Partridge Brook near the county farm was destroyed in the flood of 1936, and many bridges went out on the Connecticut River. They called it the 100-year flood, but of course, the flooding with the hurricane two years later was much, much worse. But that's the only covered bridge that I know of that was lost to the flood of 1936. And in addition to flooding, arson 
continues to be the number one cause of loss of covered bridges today. And Unfortunately. I, I know, I, I know. And Cheshire County was definitely no stranger to this. Uh, in the village bridge that connected Walpole, New Hampshire, to Westminster over the Connecticut River was built in 1870, and it served for 40 years. And it has a very unique story. Can you tell us about what happened to that bridge? It does have a very unique story. As you said, the bridge, long covered bridge across the river, served travelers for 40 years. But on April 1st of 1910, a fire broke out on the bridge in the evening, and the volunteer firefighters responded immediately. But by the time they got there, the structure was fully engulfed in flames, and the spectacular blaze really completely destroyed the bridge. Because of the circumstances around the fire, arson was suspected, and an investigation was begun, and a fellow from Walpole named George Tiffany reported that he had seen Arthur Norrington, a man he knew on the bridge just before the fire broke out. Shortly thereafter, Norrington, a resident of Westminster across the river from us, confessed to the crime. His wife apparently had a job with the Holland family in Walpole, and it seems that Norrington's motive in setting the fire was to prevent her from crossing the bridge to go to work. Didn't want his wife to work. <laughs> and he felt that she would have to stay at home in Westminster if the bridge was gone. Well, he accomplished his purpose temporarily because they built another bridge, but the authorities didn't care for the way that he did that, so he was sent to the state prison because of the arson, and the two towns were soon linked with a more modern bridge. I guess that's, that's one way to keep your wife at home. <laughs> I don't <laughs> yeah, burn the bridge. <laughs> the Melvin Bridge in Winchester was destroyed in 1965 by arson. Can you tell us about that? Um, I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, the bridge, Melvin Bridge, as you mentioned in Winchester, spanned the Ashwila River on what is now known as Melvin Bridge Road, north of the village. It was a long bridge across the river, obviously, more than 100 feet. The 1965 fire was discovered by a woman who lived near the bridge, and she called mutual aid, the emergency number, at 3.34 in the morning. So it occurred in the middle of the night on the morning of November 9th. Winchester's three pieces of fire equipment quickly arrived at the scene, but the flames had spread throughout the bridge, and it collapsed into the river soon after the crews got there. By 7 o'clock the next morning, all that remained were the charred remains sitting in the river. The fire was later determined to be arson, but I don't have details concerning whether the arsonist was caught and punished for starting the fire. Hmm. Certainly one that I've talked about several times is the arson of the Slate Bridge in the Westport neighborhood. It was destroyed by arson in 1993, in addition to two other covered bridges in the state that were destroyed the same year. That's right. and, um, and, but that bridge was rebuilt. And I, I did interview Francis Faulkner, who spearheaded the the fundraising right. for that, that project. And it, it took a while for that to happen. But why do you think the covered bridge in Westport was rebuilt and the Melvin Bridge wasn't? Or are they not? Are they apples and oranges? No, they're not. They're, you're right. 40, 40 years had passed and people were looking at covered bridges a little differently, I believe. And, and Swansea was famous for its covered bridges and they wanted covered bridges in place. So people really now are more emotionally attached, I think, to covered bridges than in the past. They're, they're part of local history. The public really wants to protect and preserve them because they illustrate really an earlier, earlier time, a different pace of life. And they, they really show us a great deal about the heritage of small town New England. What does that mean to you personally to be affiliated with a with a county with such a rich covered bridge heritage? Well, being a historian and having worked at the Historical Society for so long, the, the covered bridges have always been important to the region and to me. We get lots of people coming here to view the bridges. And as I say, the local residents are very interested in preserving them because of their heritage and history, they allow people to travel to small towns like Swansea. And the reason Swansea has so many surviving is because they were on smaller back roads where you could still use them and not have to worry about speeding traffic. 
So people are interested in heritage tourism today. They want to go to see what life used to be like in small town New England. And we have so many wonderful small villages around here that have not changed. But the covered bridges really are a magnet for people to to come to this area and learn about local history. You talked about the Historical Society of Cheshire County. Can you tell our listeners about that? Yes, thank you. The Historical Society of Cheshire County is the only countywide historical society in New England. So we deal with all 23 communities in southwest New Hampshire. So we have a wide range of programming that we do. We do 150 programs a year here at the Historical Society. Our headquarters are located on Main Street, where we house 300,000 items of local history interest for research and exhibit. And the organization is nearing 100 years old, so we get wonderful support from the community, and it is just wonderful to work for a, a mid-sized organization where everybody can get involved in all of the projects, and we get to do something a little different every day. That's wonderful. And people can join? Yes, the organization is a membership, nonprofit membership institution. Um, you can go to the Historical Society's website to learn more about us. We also have a YouTube channel and a variety of things available online for people to look at and see. But at our website, um, hsccnh. Dot org. You can learn much more about the society and about membership. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I am a, a member and also very grateful to you, um, not only for helping me with the research for Covered Bridges of New Hampshire, but for sparking the interest in actually writing a book. You were the first person to put it out <laughs> there that it was possible for someone like me to write a book. So I give you credit for starting this this journey for me. With without that, I would. I be remember here. that well. You you give me credit, but you may also blame me. You had no idea what you were getting into. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is true. But no, this this has been a wonderful journey, and and for me, it's been. There's so much more that didn't go into the book, and and part of it is meeting people that work to preserve covered bridges, and you. Um, work to preserve history. And that's a huge part of why we still have the covered bridges that, that we have. So I'm, I'm grateful for your support and um, for the work that you do. So thank you for talking to me today. Thank you very much for having me. Covered Bridges of New Hampshire is created by me and recorded in Hancock, New Hampshire. The song Old New Hampshire was arranged and performed by Josh Black. The introduction is courtesy of Greg Kretschmar. This podcast is a companion to my book, Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. You can find out more about the book, the podcast, blog posts, upcoming events, and an interactive covered bridge map at coveredbridgesnh.com. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Covered Bridges of New Hampshire. Please rate, review, and subscribe to or follow the podcast on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Kim Chandler. Thanks for listening.